Hello and welcome to Coffee is for Closers. As always, I'm your host, Tim Brigham, and today with me is somebody special. I'm going to let her take it away. Serena Phillips Dunn, it's great to see you and thank you for coming on. Thanks so much for having me. Appreciate it. For those who don't know who you are, please uh, introduce yourself. Yeah, so um, I'm a real estate agent. I work for um, Option Realty Group um, under the Corey Tanzer Group, um, and I am the South Loop, South Loop specialist there. Um, but, you know, I work all over suburbs, city, um, but South Loop's my home, so that's kind of where my bread and butter is. That's awesome. So let's first start with some numbers, right? Yeah. I, I think you, uh, when, did you, when did you get into real estate? So I started, um, I got my license December 2016 and I started 2017, um, was my first sale in January. And- um, Oh, wow. Yeah. So, quickly. Yeah, quickly. And then um, since then, you know, it's kind of been exponential. My team last year did about 55 million, um, about a hundred homes. And I was personally a part of about 10 million of those sales. So you started out, you know, just, and if you were sharing backstage that it was kind of a part-time thing in the beginning, right? Yeah. And hit the ground running and instantly got a sale. And then you've grown each year since then. Yeah, absolutely. I, um, I was working in a completely different industry. I moved to Chicago for grad school for broadcasting. And during grad school, I got um, hired on as a field producer for a top three network here. And um, a quarter life crisis kind of uh, shifted me into real estate. Where, I love that quarter life yeah, crisis. Yeah, I was like 25. I was freaking out. You know, I was looking at the trajectory of the career that I enjoyed at the time. And I just couldn't see myself um, at a higher level enjoying a desk job because mm -hmm. the job that I had was a field job and I was in different neighborhoods and I was out all the time meeting people, um, seeing all of Chicago. And that really, for me, was what I loved about the job. But, you know, the pay um, was just not there. And if I were to move up, it would be a desk job. And I didn't want to be camera in front of the camera. Um, so I just kind of freaked out and said, what do I do? Um, and I remember having this breakdown. I was on a balcony at like three in the morning in my condo and trying to figure out what I was going to do. And my boyfriend at the time, who is now my husband, uh, said, well, you've been talking about real estate since I've known you. And why don't you take the jump? But the jump is scary because as we all know, it's a commission based job. Where's mm -hmm. the money coming from? And um, I didn't have a car. Now, obviously, it's Chicago metropolitan area. You can take public transport, but real estate, you really at some point need a car. And he said, well, you have my car. I have a car, so now you have a car. And he was willing to bite the bullet. And That's sweet. Yeah. I love how supportive he is. Yeah, like yeah. Dude. I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for him, you know, just just even based off that one conversation alone, because it gave me enough confidence in the push mm -hmm. that I could branch out and quit the job that I had just spent, you know, college and grad school trying to figure out. And, um, I was in the service industry at the time, you know, in conjunction with my broadcasting job to pay the bills. And I just picked up more shifts, picked up more jobs. And I, I used real estate as my focus of my career. And but I knew at the beginning it was going to be tough. And I knew that there wasn't going to be money flowing in right away. And a lot of the money that you get coming in goes back out to licensing and marketing and things like that. So I just juggled them all. Yeah, I think it's, a normal, it's like what you just described is a natural progression, right? Mm -hmm. There's in Chicago, I found there's a lot of people who are in, you know, hospitality where they'll meet a lot of people. And then, you know, where do you go from there? They'll go from, right. you know, the bar scene, if you will, and then turn it into, you know, a real estate career, which it mm -hmm. sounds like you've had great success with. Not everybody has success with it. They'll close one yeah. deal and then they just realize it's actually hard work and yeah. you have to be a professional and they find themselves back at the bar scene. Right. Which, you know, no offense to them. And it's just, it's a hard business. Yeah. So congratulations to you. It sounds like you've, you've, Thank you. you've mastered that. Yeah, definitely full time now with real estate. You know, I have my own multiple streams of in income with investments and things like that. Um, but if it wasn't for that service industry, mm -hmm. I don't know that I would be here now because I would have just been so desperate for the commissions um, that y that's why a lot of people fizzle out. They can't last the year. They can't last the two years. And then, you know, th year three was really where I started to see a lot of return clients, people who were renting from me in the beginning who now want to buy or people who had bought with me that now need to sell and buy something larger. So yeah. you, you just had to stick it out. Yeah. And I think a lot of people, they'll, you know, I don't know, if, I don't know if you agree, but um, 
I've had clients that, for example, on the mortgage side, they can't buy a house, you know, for a couple of years. Right. And, and some loan officers will look at this and they'll be like, oh, well, you know, like that's just a dead lead. Mm -hmm. No, it's somebody's family. Like, what are you talking right. about? You got to stay in touch right. with these people, help them. And who knows, in a few years, you know, it might, might turn into something. Yeah. Have you had that experience? Yeah. So, you know, a lot of what I kind of base my personality in real estate is, is I don't like to push people. Mm. I feel like that creates a really... Um, insecure clients mm. and they may not say it to your face you may be able to push them to the finish line but they're not going to come back to you when they need to sell or they need to buy and you may not have any idea you've gotten your commission you feel happy your your money's in the bank but at the end of the day that person may have an unsettled feeling they're not going to be leaving you glowing recommendations they're not going to be telling their friends about you and anything that they see that's incorrect in their house they're going to be like oh, i shouldn't have done this and i shouldn't have let that person talk me into this and i think that in real estate you really have to just be genuine and know that this is somebody's home. And if it's an investor, it's somebody's money. At the end of the day, it's not you. You're. I don't like to consider myself a salesperson. And this is going to sound like douchey and, you know, I, but I consider myself a consultant because at the end of the day, I want to consult them on what is the right choice for them at that time. And sometimes the right choice isn't to buy. It's Sometimes it's not to move. Sometimes it's, hey, wait. And with that, I've seen a lot of people who reached out to me years ago. Now they're circling back and and they're comfortable enough with me and knowing that I'm not going to push them, that they don't feel embarrassed for, you know, quote unquote, wasting my time years ago. They, they're comfortable, you know, and I, I think, sorry. I, no, no, you're good. No, I, I you just made, you gave me pause here. How did you transition from from the bar scene of like what I've heard from some people is that, you know, they'll they'll. Well, this person, they, they have the opinion. This I was just serving this person drinks. Are they really going right. to trust me with their real estate, you know, investments? Right. Because yeah. that's a, that's not the same thing. Right. right. And there's a negative connotation behind being in the bar scene yeah. versus you know money. Right. So how did you how did you transition that? Um, I think it was just really about relationship building. And I did have um, one of my first mentors in the industry. She did not want me to be working in the bar scene. And at the end of the day, I had to. I had to pay my bills. Mm -hmm. And you know, it wasn't wasn't up to her. But I also didn't believe it intrinsically that I wouldn't be able to turn this into something that could be bigger in real estate. And, you know, now I have old managers that are buying from me. I have busboys that are reaching out. I have clients that were customers, you know, that I was serving nachos to and what were I was serving the drinks. And I think a lot of it was just, you know, how I presented myself there, um, the knowledge that I have and, you know, just my background and being able to speak to people and connect with them and gain their trust. And now with social media, they're able to like follow me and see, okay, you did leverage your career. You didn't just jump into real estate for six months and then jump out. You are actually now, you know, in the business for a while and doing well and, and they're, they're reaching out. And, you know, at the end of the day, people need houses, people need homes. Um, even your real, even your bus boys, even your dishwashers, even your, you know, bartenders. Yeah. I think un unpacking that for a minute, right. For anybody listening, it's, it's, it's interesting, right? You, your Instagram and your social media game, if you will. Right. A lot of people, I think they look at it maybe in a different lens. Yeah. Whereas it sounds like what you're saying is, is that you can be a professional and still be in the service industry, but as long as you show that you know what you're talking mm -hmm. about and you present yourself that way, yeah, I think a lot of people will go after social media in a way that they need to be emulate somebody too much. Right. They're trying to be somebody that they're they aspire to be, mm -hmm. right? Instead of being more genuine, right? Because you'll find that some people are attracted to you because of you, not right. because of that. They, otherwise, they'd go work with that agent. Yeah. They want to work with you because they trust you because right. you actually had a conversation with them was genuine. Yeah. Right? You know, and I, I really think that desperation doesn't stink. It reeks. Mm -hmm. And if a client thinks that you're desperate, yeah. they're going to smell it all over you. Commission breath. Yeah. Exactly. And it yeah. doesn't mean don't hustle your ass off. Don't work the listing and tell them I'm going to do the best I can for you. That's yeah. not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the desperation that you you need to push them into a sale in order to to get your commission. Yeah. And and that is just it's the used car sales salesman, you know, mm -hmm. vibe, use car, and salesman, use yeah, car sure. salesman vibe. And I've never wanted to be that. I think that, you know, my own millennial guilt won't let me push people into a poor investment. And I think that, you know, that's really where the basis of my clientele has come because a lot of my clients now are, are repeat customers or referrals. And it's just people who've trusted me. And I, I'm so grateful for the people who trusted me at the beginning of my career, because, you know, what do you really have to show at the beginning? You really can only 
have them trust in your personality with them and you know how they know you as a person because if you don't have sales in the beginning that's all that they can go off of 100 percent, 100 percent. so let's back up you just brought it up so the beginnings of your career who was your mentor when you started in the business so i started um in the south loop which is where i live now um and i wanted to find somebody who was down there so i started kind of cold calling brokerages mm -hmm. um and i ended up with margie smigel and she has a small bro boutique brokerage she'd been in the business for a long time she started in hyde park mm -hmm. um so when i started with her i was kind of doing south loop hyde park south side and then um when I decided it was time to kind of grow and expand, um, somebody in the restaurant industry actually gave me the contact to my current um, team lead, who is Corey, and he was building a team. And he's not too far ahead of me in terms of years in the industry, but he's done such great work and he goes off the same kind of basis where it's, um, community connection and interpersonal connection and what can you do for your neighbor? Not because it's going to get me something back, but because like that's just who he is as a person. Yeah. And um, that I'm so grateful that for that phone call, because I was about to go with somebody, three other people I had, I had offers from and just the conversation I had with him. I was like, you know what? This feels right. And he also gave me the opportunity to be his team lead in the South loop. So mm. that, you know, Again, South Loop is where I live. I really believe in it. And as somebody who's not from Chicago and didn't really know anybody here when I moved here, um, I love getting to tell people, especially in the South, if you get a lot of people who move here for jobs and aren't from Chicago, part of what I love about it is really expressing the conveniences of Chicago and the area and everything it has to offer. And and I really believe in it, you know? Your, your experience is, is invaluable because I think some people are so I mean, I'm from Tucson, yeah. right? And I came here with everything I owned in a backpack. That's right. a real thing, right? So when I came here, I was like wide-eyed looking around going, wow, there's big cities. This is cool. Like, tell me more, mm -hmm. right? Whereas if you grew up here, I bet you know those things, but you yeah. maybe don't ask the same types of questions because right. you're so comfortable. Yeah. Um, I think with you, you know, coming from even another country, right? I think we were yeah. talking backstage, you, 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 where did you go to college? Yeah, so I, I grew up in Vegas. Well, I moved to Vegas from Singapore with mm -hmm. my family when I was a child. And um, when I went to college um, in 2008, when the market crashed, um, I originally was in Texas for a little bit, but then realized I wanted to travel. And I had done some time in boarding school in Switzerland. And I said, you know what, I want to travel, but I want to keep getting my degree. Mm -hmm. um, so I transferred to an American university in Switzerland and, and finished out my time there. Wow. Um, so wow. And, and that really gave me a sense of the world and a sense of so many different types of people. I think I was like only one of 10 Americans that I graduated with. There was, you know, every, oh, wow. there, there were wow. so many countries represented. And a lot of that gave me the the skill set to connect with people on multiple different different levels. That That's that's invaluable. I mean, I, I think that it also relates, you know, it, points to why you're able to have conversations with people right. naturally, right? right. Um, I, I did get the chance to sit in on one of your team meetings mm -hmm. and, I, you know, you and Corey and the entire crew watching you guys live and you all did it virtual. I think you were driving in your car. I was driving from a showing. I like dialed in halfway through. Yeah. <laughs> but you, but you, you saw enough importance that you made time for it, right? Right. That's one thing, right? When you see, when you see team meetings and people don't show up, that's a, that's, that's kind of a sign. Yeah. yeah maybe I should be there. I shouldn't. And then I started to watch you guys were sharing with each other and helping each other in ways that I've never seen. Like you all were yeah. intentional of going out of your way to making sure this person knew that you had their back right. and, and helping, you know, with what they had going on in their space and asking questions. Mm -hmm. But I do have to ask you, you gave a presentation on there that was gold. Would you be willing to share it here? Yeah. It, it's, yeah if you're absolutely. watching, you need to hear this. <laughs> so, um, one thing that I've taken and kind of learned and used in my career is I really utilize reverse prospecting, but I don't utilize it in the way that most people do. I mean, I do, but the, the secret sauce that I find is using it bef while you're presenting a listing, because if you're trying to find price point and you're trying to figure out, you know, where should we be price wise? Yes, you can use comps and you can use all of those things, but ultimately your seller is going to want to get as much money as they can. And for me, with reverse prospecting, it gives data and proof is in the pudding um, type of mentality towards it, where I can bring a listing presentation to a potential 
um, seller and say, hey, look, you know, this is the price point you want to be. And I already did a mock listing for you. And then I let it reverse prospect. And at this price point, you only have 100 buyers. But if you price it $5,000 less, now you have 150, buy 150 buyers and things like that. And then you're able to really show them with data. And you can say, we'll start where you want to start. But, you know, let's give a certain amount of time and then let's drop, drop to here or Another thing that I like to do is take that one level further is if we do start at the level where you're at 100 buyers, not 150, I still have all that reverse prospecting data from the 150. So now I'm going to reach out to those other agents and, you know, they may be a little bit priced out, but their client could have some wiggle room or at least now they have knowledge of your property. And um, I've done that with a lot of my listings. I've also done that. We just had um, the record highest single family sale in Pilsen at just under 1.6 million. And the way that we got foot traffic was, um, you know, there weren't any comps in the area. I think I went to this one. Right, yeah, exactly. It was beautiful. Yeah, yeah, it was a gorgeous house, but there were no comps. So, you know, we comped to Ukrainian and South Loop and um, everybody can argue that it's not the same. Sure, it's not the same. But what we did then was I took all of the agents who had listings in those areas and I created mock listings. I created a listing that had a $1.6 million price point. I created a listing that had a $1.5 million price point and I created them in the other neighborhoods in mm -hmm. South Loop, like very similar features to the home, bedroom, size, layout, garage, things like that. But I placed them in other neighborhoods and I said, who's got buyers in these neighborhoods that are looking for this price point and this type of home? Mm -hmm. And then I just started reaching out to them. Hmm. And, you know, I think I created like 12 listings. And I spent probably like nine hours, you know, contacting people and um, adding them to a spreadsheet and doing all of that. And, you know, with that, I was able to get eyes on the property where people may not have been looking at Pilsen and the person who ended up buying it was living close, you know, to Bucktown. That's so, wow. um, and they weren't looking at Pilsen at all. But once it came across their radar, they, you know, the house spoke for itself and, you know, I put in the legwork and then the house sold itself. Wow. Yeah. I mean, it's it's a completely different way to attack a market that yeah. I've never even heard of. Yeah. Right. And I think that I'll admit it right to the entire real estate real, realtor industry. I apologize for many years. I thought that you just show up to a house and I think like, this what, is great. You right. should buy it. Right. Yeah. Like we don't we don't. Oh, you want to sell it? Cool. Yeah. Let's put it on the market. And here's what the comps say. There's an actual art form to this. There's there's right. true strategy to get to this sale and especially in this market, right? Yeah. To sell a $1.6 million home it takes real skill. I mean, yeah. the luxury market is not an easy market to navigate right now. Yeah, you know, and and I like to look at real estate as like in its current iteration, it's real estate's like Tinder. Everybody gets on their phone and if you don't capture their attention in the first three swipes or the first 10 seconds, you're done. Yeah. And now you're at the bottom of the algorithm and now they got to come back up. So you have to A, market your your listing so that you are capturing right at the beginning. And photos, guys, it's such an easy thing, but there's so many places that have terrible photos, which is my favorite thing to buy and invest in personally because those listings sit on the market. They price drop, they price drop, they price drop. I buy them, wait, and then, then wait for a few years and sell them, you know, because they're already under value at that point. But I think that, you know, if if you can get their attention in the first 10 seconds, then you're ready above and beyond what other people are doing because people are just swiping over the listings. And then after that, then you have to put in the groundwork. You can't just sit and wait and hope that you're going to pop up again in somebody's phone. You have to make the calls. You have to call the agents. Um, you know, with that listing, I also went through and, you know, found the top agents for all the zip codes and started emailing them. You know, these are the ones that sold in the two millions and the ones that sold into 1.5s. And, you know, you have to make yourself known. And uh, most of them didn't realize that the property was even your there. Your broker open that you hosted. It's my first time ever been being to that property order. Your broker open was awesome. It was the who's who of real estate walking around through this thing. Yeah. And that doesn't just happen. Right. right? Broker opens are, are fragile. Everybody thinks, oh, okay, you can do this and people are going to show up. No, the, yeah. you have to you have to be intentional you have to make these phone calls. Just sending out an email is not going to get somebody there. You have to call them. Yeah. You have to engage and say, hey, listen, I have something here. It's worth your time. Yeah. Right. And not only did you have a completely full house, we had people walking into the property trying to view the property mm -hmm. because of all the activity. I right. thought it was brilliant. I thought it was brilliant. Spe doing all of the things, not just throwing up there and hoping it sticks. You right, know? you know, and, and that was a seller who didn't want any open houses. Yeah. Um, he wanted only pre-approved buyers to come through. And it was tough in the beginning. And I said, look, let us do a broker's open. And he said, well, it's 
most brokers open, so people don't come. And I said, I will, I will get people through the door. And he was thrilled, you know, and we sold, I think, a week later. I mean, the house was stunning. It, it was, was so gorgeous. cool. The it upstairs was, was amazing. Yeah. yeah it was and a beautiful house. Historically, also significant, you know, that they kept a lot of the old brick and it was just a really great property. I think it had an Airbnb feature too or something, yeah, right? Yeah. yeah. Cool. That, that's, you know, the, in, in this in this economy with the interest rates, I mean, that's huge. So speaking of the industry, right? Um, and, and again, you know, you have had success con consistently, right? Mm -hmm. That isn't, that's rare, right? Users ebbs and flows. You've been consistently growing with yeah. each year. What advice would you have for anybody listening to you that's maybe struggling with consistency or, or, or growth yeah. right now? Um, you know, I would say, A, it goes back to the honesty. Just make sure that you're being really honest with your clients. Um, sometimes, no, don't do this is, is the right answer. Um, honesty and patience, you know, with your clients. Um, but also consistency in in terms of what you're doing on on the back end. Am I going to say that I sit at home every single day and reverse prospect and, and market plan? And, you know, everybody likes to say that, oh, I work 24-7. That's not the case. Yeah, I, do I probably work seven days a week? Sure, but not all day every day. Um, but, you know, in my free time, I do you know, farm my building. I do, um, you Can know. Can you expand on that? Like, what are the activities that you do that yeah. make money? So um, my building specifically, I, um, I sell a lot in my building because I've been there now, you know, nine years and people know me. And, um, but I, every time I make a listing or sell a listing or li sell a listing or list in the building, I'll m make a postcard. I'll also put, you know, my, my team leads, um, history and sales on the back and i'll also put you know what i've sold in the building and that i'm actually a homeowner there and have been there for a long time um social media and it's not just posting your own things i think it's also engaging with other agents because i like to look at social media on the work side of it as you know they probably have something that I could offer to my client. So if I'm just posting my own thing and, you know, saying, you know, now that I'm done with my social media, I'm going to go to my personal social media and that's where I'm going to scroll. I think it's important to look at what the people around you are doing as well. Um, and also be discerning about like what's real and what's not, you know. I think it's important that too, that we support each other. Yeah. Right. And, and I, it's so 100%. strange to me. Social media is such a weird animal. Yeah. And people just, it's me, 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 me. Sure. Yeah. It's self-serving, yeah. but does it really hurt you to go like somebody else's post? I mean, to comment no. on, to help each other, to, wow, that is a great listing. Yeah. Congratulations on getting that. Yeah. yeah. That doesn't hurt you in any way. You know, yeah. and in fact, think about it. The person's creating something. They're just hoping that somebody cares or pays attention to it. What does it do you, by you doing that, if you yeah. get into a deal with somebody, they're yeah. going to remember that you're supportive and that you're a good person, right? right? Help each other. True yeah. community versus, you know, oh, it's me. I'm the best. I'm yeah. the best. Well, that, yeah, great. That's awesome. Yeah. But, you know, maybe help each other a little bit. It's such an ego driven industry. And I think taking ego out of it, like I said, people can it's it's the desperation. People can see desperation and they can also smell an ego that doesn't have anything to back it up. Yeah. And I think that just taking the ego out of it, it's a cooperative industry. You know, that's why it's a co-op commission and people lose such sight of that so early on in their, in their career. And, you know, I think that if you can work well with other realtors, that's really going to help you expand, you know, your clientele. It's going to help you, you know, maybe you're not the right realtor for somebody. I mean, and by saying I'm not the one for you, but this person that I know is going to be great for you, that, that client that you just turned away is going to look at you like, like you have just shown a light on something that they've never even thought before, that you're not just money hungry and, and trying to grab, you know, at anything that falls. And they're probably going to say, hey, you know, Serena introduced me to this realtor who was specialist in this area, but she's a specialist in this area and, and you would be great to work with her. You know, it's it's all a web and, you know, you can either make it a messy web and, and create um, issues all over the place or you can make it a web where you really can communicate with other brokers and other agencies and in a and comfortable way in a comfortable way absolutely help each other right yeah um i have to tell you something though i yeah. know i know i know a secret that you didn't share about your beginnings what i, I <laughs> What's know that? The, i know the real reason that you joined Corey tanzer's team yeah tell me about the dog the dog uh, calendar oh yeah the dog calendar <laughs> yeah yeah so you know being in the south loop he had this uh south loop I have to show you. Pets. Oh, do you have it? I have it. No, no. He sent it to me because Corey called me this morning and we yeah. we, we connected. It's, this, so it's funny. too funny. Hold on. So he sent me. Oh. And I think it's hysterical because it's yeah. it's 
It's, it's a, him in front of your calendar. It, yeah. You know, it's funny because um, before I joined his team, I didn't even really know, but he was sending out, you know, neighborhood stuff to the neighborhood where, and at one point he was doing a dog calendar. Um, I'm a huge dog person. I have two dogs, Jameson and Guinness. What kind of dogs are they? Um, they're both rescues. Um, my newest rescue, Guinness, she is a um, German Shepherd border collie cool. um golden retriever so she's she's a ball of energy and my other one is um husky, husky german shepherd boston terrier so he cool. thinks he's a lap dog yeah. lap dog yeah. but he's not um but with the calendar you know he'd been doing it in the neighborhood and it's basically everybody in the neighborhood sends out pictures of their dogs and he puts a calendar together and i had purchased one before i even worked with him or even knew and he just did a showing in one of my properties my personal properties that i was selling and i had one of the calendars hanging up on the wall you know from years ago um but he saw it and he he got a kick out of it i was like yeah you know it all comes around it's it's funny. I love I love yeah. how real estate isn't what you think, right? Yeah. There's so many different ways to do this. Yeah. And like think about genius that is. You're like, hey, I'm gonna make a dog calendar. I yeah. don't know. And talk about lead gen. That's yeah. that's great. Like yeah. dog people are usually good people. And right. if you're providing value and 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 recognizing that you're a dog person, hey, and then there's good follow up. You yeah. know, hey, by the way, I do real estate. Yeah. You know, and even gain people to your team from yeah. it. That's pretty amazing. Yeah, exactly. You so. know, it was it was a funny I, I love your things. team dynamic and I love that you're all about the community and yeah. uh, you seem extremely genuine and I'm so proud Thank and you. happy to see your success. Thank, I you. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. I really appreciate it. And, you know, um, being here and being able to talk about just the, the roots of real estate, I feel like people really forget about that. You know, at the end of the day, it really comes down to who you are as a person. And, mm -hmm. and that I think is going to be the best success um, and the best trajectory to success. Agreed. Agreed. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. If you enjoyed this conversation and want to see the full episode, you can find it here. If you want to subscribe, you can find that button here.